Hi, welcome to podcast number nine in MA2286, Advanced Calculus. In this podcast, I want to explain what we mean when we talk of integrating over a surface. The goal of the podcast is to end up with a reasonably precise definition of such an integral. In subsequent podcasts, we'll concentrate on how to calculate these integrals, but in the current podcast, I'm interested mainly or just in the the, the definition. To begin uh, towards the definition, um, I'll I'll consider a, a kind of a motivating problem. Suppose that you have a surface S embedded in three-dimensional space. So by a surface, I mean something like a piece of paper, uh, but the piece of paper doesn't have to be flat. It could be curved in any fashion you like, but it'll be a finite piece of paper positioned or embedded in three-dimensional space. Now, that's maybe a little bit vague. And in subsequent podcasts, when I come on to calculating uh, surface integrals, I'll need to be more precise. And in subsequent podcasts, the kind of uh, regions S in three-dimensional space that I'll be considering will be uh, those that arise as the image of nice functions from a rectangular region, uh, the unit interval AB, direct product, the unit interval CD in the plane, functions from that two-dimensional region into three-dimensional space. So functions which take uh, a, a pair of numbers UV, where U is in the region in the interval from A to B, and V is in the interval from C to D, and send such a pair of numbers UV to some triple of numbers, which are written as X, of u v, so x is a function of u v, comma y of u v, so y is a function of u v, and z of u v. Okay, but for the moment, then we can just think of s as it suffices to think of s as as a piece of paper embedded in three dimensional space. Suppose, moreover, that there are particles in three dimensional space which are traveling upwards in the z direction. Let's suppose that the particles are traveling. At constant speed, all particles traveling at the same speed in the z direction. But the density or the, 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 the of particles emanating from the x y plane uh, will allow to vary. So as we as we vary our position on the x y plane, the density of particles uh, being emitted from the x y plane can vary, and we'll we'll capture that uh, by a function which I'll call a. So then let A of x, y, z, uh, you can take z to be zero if you actually want to position yourself in the x, y plane, but in general, I'm, I'm interested in an arbitrary point x, y, z in three space. And let A of x, y, z represent uh, the number of particles passing through a region centered on the point x, y, z in three space, a region of unit area and a region which is parallel to the xy plane. So I've drawn such a region in blue there, and let A of x, y, z represent the number of particles passing through such a region. And, and uh, yeah, so with that set up, we can now ask ourselves, how many particles will pass through this surface S, from the underneath of S to the top side of S, in a one unit of time. I um, have to be a little bit careful when we talk of the underneath of S and the top side of S, because the way I've drawn S, it curves around, and I want the net number of particles. So we decide that uh, one direction, the, 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 the pointing upwards direction, is the top side of S, but because because the paper is curved around, the surface is curved around, um, the, 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 the top side actually kind of points downwards towards the right-hand side of S. And we want to consider particles which cross from the bottom to the top as contributing plus one to the count, but particles which pass from the top to the bottom of S, we want to consider as minus one in our count. Okay, so that's the motivation. And... Uh, that leads us then to the idea of defining an integral uh, to be a number. So the integral I'm going to write as the integral over the surface S 
of the function a of x, y, z times dx. And then after the dx, there's a symbol which looks like an upside down v. I'm going to call that wedge. So dx wedge dy. So this integral, we want to define it so that it's a number. And we want that number to equal the net number of particles crossing in one unit of time from the underside of s to the top side of s. So that's that's where we're going. That, that's what our definition should 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 achieve. Uh, it should kind of represent that 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 net number of particles. Um, well, one thing we can do is we can we can mimic what we did for uh, integrals along curves of, of, of differential one forms. When we were integrating along a directed and oriented curve, um, what we did was we broke the curve up into small segments and then uh, w w worked uh, t t towards an understanding of what would the integral mean on a small segment and then take a, a sum of all the small segments and then a limit of the sum. That was the idea in uh, one dimension. Well, we're going to do the same thing again. So we'll break our region S up, in our surface S, into small subsurfaces. And to make things uh, as easy as possible, we'll take our subsurfaces to be triangles. Now, uh, the triangles I want to consider, actually, I want to only consider planar flat triangles. So to achieve that, um, I'm going to insist that the vertices of all these triangles lie on the surface S, but I will allow a triangle at, in its center to be a little bit distant from S. The more triangles we take and the smaller they are, the better the approximation we can get to S in terms of a union of planar triangles. And so, so that's what we want to do. We want to consider a union of planar triangles. I'll, I'll call them T1, T2, union Tn. And then we want that to form a, a, a triangulated surface. And we want that yellow surface to be a good approximation to S in the sense that every point of S is close to some point of the yellow triangulation and no point of the yellow triangulation is too far from any point of s i suppose that's but yeah so that's 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 what we could try to do get a good approximation in terms of planar triangles a union of planar triangles and then if we want to count the net number of particles crossing from the underside of s to the top side of s well approximately we should just be able to work out the number of particles crossing from the underside of each triangle in the triangulation to the top side and take the sum of all those. And that sum will be an approximation to the net number of particles crossing from the underside of S to the top side of S. OK, well, we don't um, want to take just one partition, but uh, copying what we did in the, the case of uh, differential one forms and integrating over curves, we actually want to take a limit of partitions. So let's suppose that we have a sequence of partitions, which I'll call P1, P2, P3, and so on. Each is an approximation to S, but let's suppose that in some fairly obvious sense, the sequence of partitions becomes a better and better approximation to S. And if we have such a sequence of partitions, we can then define uh, this number, this integral over s of the function a of x, y, z times dx, wedge dy, we can define that number to be the limit of the sum of over all the triangles, which I'll call tj in the nth partition, pn, uh, well, the sum of the net number of particles passing from the underside of tj to the top side of tj. And if we take the triangles small enough, hopefully this function a of x, y, z will be roughly constant on each triangle. So um, when we're working out the, the summands on the right hand side, we'll, we'll get away with considering not functions a, but constant numbers a.
Okay, so that's that's the that's the the idea of the the definition. And concluding that 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 um, discussion, then, in order to define uh, our integral over the surface S of a function a of x y z dx y dy, what we really need to do is define the integral over a planar triangular region T of a number, a constant a dx y dy. Okay for t a planar triangular region and constant a so i've drawn such a, a planar triangular region there i call it p q r now just to go back and repeat uh, what i was saying this surface s is curved uh, back on itself towards the right hand end so when we're counting particles we do have to be careful about whether the particles are going from the underside through the surface and out through the top side or over on the bottom right hand part of the surface particles will actually enter the top side and leave through the underside so those particles will be counting contributing a minus one to the count uh, whereas particles are on the on the on the top left of the the surface s they'll be contributing a plus one so we do have to be careful about the top and bottom. And for that, uh, we introduce the notion of an orientation. So let me say something about orientation. Well, firstly, an orientation, if you think of a straight line, we can orient a straight line. We either go forwards or backwards. You know, the the oriented interval on the real, you know, real interval from A to B. We either go from A to B or from B to A. So that's clear what we mean by orientation. Well, when we have a triangle, um, the orientation should capture the fact that there are just two sides to the triangle. There's one side and there's another side. And one way to capture that is by using a, a a circular arrow so there I've drawn a, a, a triangle T twice but I've drawn two different arrows on the triangle one going anti-clockwise and the one on the right going clockwise and we can use uh, such arrows to capture which side of the or, or which way around the triangle the, the, yeah, to the top side and the bottom side of, of the triangle um, so there are two orientations then, two ways of placing curved triangle, cur curved arrows on a, on a triangle. Um, and on the left, with the arrow going anti-clockwise, uh, if I didn't want to use arrows, but I just wanted to talk about vertices, I could capture the, 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 the anti-clockwise direction of the arrow by saying that we're actually passing around the vertices from P then to R then to Q. Um, or I could equally start at Q and say we're going from Q to P to R. Or I could equally well start at R and say we're going from R to Q to P. So th these orderings, P, R, Q, Q, P, R, R, Q, P, all represent the orientation on the left-hand triangle. On the right-hand triangle, we have a different orientation. And we can capture that if we want using the vertex orderings by saying that the right uh, hand uh, clockwise orientation corresponds to an ordering on the vertices of PQR or QRP or RPQ. Okay, so we have, we have the notion of an orientation on a triangle and that's analogous to the notion of an orientation on a unit interval when we're in the, the real line. So a triangle is a is a is the simplest kind of region in the the plane R2, uh, 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 and a, a, an interval from A to B is the simplest kind of region in the real line R1 uh, R. So I'm going to work by analogy. Okay, so then what do we mean by an orientation on a surface? Well, by an orientation on a surface. We just mean which side are we talking about? Are we talking about one side or the other? The, the way I've drawn it now, there's a kind of a top side and a bottom side. But had I drawn the surface embedded differently, it might not make sense to talk of top and bottom. 
but there are certainly two sides to a piece of paper and we capture that notion uh, using uh, the idea of orientation so uh, we 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 denote a, a, a side a preferred side um, so suppose I prefer the top side, I can, I can denote that in pictures by drawing an arrow at right angles, perpendicular to the surface, emanating out of uh, the top side of the surface. Equally well, I could have drawn an arrow uh, pointing out of the bottom side of the surface, but there are only two ways to draw that arrow. And when I draw an arrow in blue like that, um, if I want, I can also um, visualize a, 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 an, an arrow in this way going anti-clockwise when I look from the head, a, a white curved arrow going anti-clockwise. Well, it's going anti-clockwise provided I look at that arrow, which is at the foot of the, the white curved arrow is at the foot of the blue arrow. And if I look from the head of the blue arrow to the foot of the blue arrow, the white curved arrow is going anti-clockwise. So um, these, this choice of side of a surface, I can uh, represent just by pick, picking a blue arrow. And then when I have such a blue arrow, I'll have a, a, a white curved arrow going anti-clockwise when viewed from the top of the blue arrow. Now, given an orientation on a surface, if we have an approximation to the surface where the triangles are essentially more or very, very close to, to being you know, part of the surface, the orientation on the surface S induces, in a fairly obvious way, I think, an orientation on the triangles. Yeah. What's an orientation on a triangle? It's just a curved arrow. So you see that the, the, if, the, if that blue triangle were actually part of the surface S, then the way I've drawn the, 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 the anti-clockwise arrow at the foot of the, the blue uh, perpendicular arrow, I could just move it down to the yellow triangle and I'd, I'd end up with um, an orientation on the yellow triangle. Well, I've drawn two yellow triangles there, but they both inherit an orientation and I've drawn the orientations. Um, so those yellow triangles have orientations induced by one orientation that we've decided, one choice of side for the surface S. Okay, so um, now that we have orientations or the notion of top and bottom side or whatever, um, we, can, we can make a definition. So I'm only interested for the moment in considering not surfaces in general, but planar triangular regions. They're very special kinds of surfaces. If I have a planar triangular region, that's a very special kind of surface, and that's what I'm going to focus on. So suppose you have a planar triangular region T in three dimensions, and suppose that you have a constant number A. Okay, so rather than A being a function, for the moment it suffices to consider it as a constant. Then we can make the following definition. We can define the integral over the triangular region T of the number A dx wedge dy. The definition can be the following. It's plus or minus, well, it has to be one or the other, and I'll say something about that in a moment. It's plus or minus the number A times, and then what we can do is we can take our triangle, which I've drawn in yellow in the picture there, and we can project this yellow triangle down onto the xy plane, meaning that um, every coordinate, if I take the, the, the vertex P of the yellow triangle, that will be determined by three numbers, x, y, z. Well, set z equal to zero, and then I'll get a number x, y, zero in the x, y plane. And I can do that for every point in my, my yellow triangle, and I'll end up with uh, what I've colored blue, a blue triangle in the x, y plane. That blue triangle in the xy plane uh, will have a different area, typically, to the yellow triangle, but it's the area of the blue triangle that I'm interested in, and I can define this integral to be plus or minus the number a times 
the area of the blue triangle. So to be fancy, I'm, the notation I'm giving for the blue triangle is I'm, I'm, my, my projection uh, I'm considering to be a, a, a function rho of xy, which sends xyz to xy or xy0. And then the triangle T gets sent to the blue triangle, which I'm denoting rho of xy of T. Okay, so that's um, a definition, but for the issue of plus or minus, and as we've seen from the m motivating problem, the plus and the minus is crucial in all of this. So let's think about the plus and the minus. The sign will be plus one when the triangle, the blue triangle, rho xy of t, has anti-clockwise orientation when viewed from above. So if you walk up the z-axis and view the blue projected triangle, uh, the, the orientation on the yellow triangle t will induce an orientation on the blue triangle. And if that orientation is anti-clockwise, well, take the sign to be plus one. But if the orientation on the blue triangle is clockwise when viewed from up the z-axis, then we'll take the sign in the, the integral to be minus one. And so now we have a definition of the integral over a planar triangular region T of a number A times dx wedge dy. Well, we can do the same thing uh, for dy wedge dz. There was nothing particularly special about dx and dy. I can, I can do, make a similar definition for dy wedge dz, but this time what do we do? Um, I've kept my uh, axes. It's, I'm always using um, the same convention for axes. I, uh, I put the x-axis in line with my thumb and then I put the y-axis in line with my next finger and then my middle finger uh, I, I put the z-axis and however I draw my x-y-axis I'm using this right, so of the right hand, of my right hand, I'm using this right hand rule. So the, 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 the three fingers, the, the thumb, the first finger, the middle finger, correspond to X, Y, and Z. And however I draw my three uh, axes, I can rotate them, but I always uh, adhere to that convention that they correspond to the, the fingers on my, my right hand. That's the right hand rule. So with that convention, we can uh, repeat the definition uh, of the integral before to get a definition of an integral over the same planar triangular region T of the number a dy wedge dz. And here we'll define it to be plus or minus the area of the triangle got by projecting t onto the yz plane. So you project the yellow triangle onto the blue triangle in the yz plane, work out the area of the blue triangle, and then your integral is the number a times that blue area times plus or minus one depending again on the, the, the orientation. So if the blue triangle is oriented uh, with, with, a, with a clockwise uh, arrow when viewed from the x-axis, up the x-axis, then we have a plus one. And if the blue triangle has a, 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 an orientation corresponding to a, an anti-clockwise arrow when viewed from up the x-axis, our sign will be minus one. And of course, we can do the same thing for dz and dx. Yeah, so we can define the integral over a planar triangular region T of the number a dz wedge dx. It's just a definition. And again, we project onto the xz or zx plane. Doesn't... Oh, I've made a mistake here. Um, the zx plane, let me correct it. Um, so I have to make sure that my axes are right. So I'm going to use the right hand rule. So uh, I'm going to use the, um, uh, let, me, let me think about it. The right hand rule is, um, so, so I'm, I'm the X is going up the, so I'm doing it in white. X is going in that, no, sorry, the, the, sorry the, the Y is what I'm eliminating. Y is going in, in that direction. So if Y is going in that direction, maybe I need to change a bit more here. Uh, y is going in that direction. So then 
uh, I want to go to the, the, the I want to put a Z and an X according to the right hand rule. So um, I'm going to put my X down uh, in this direction. Sorry, X is in that direction, Y is in that direction, and Z is in this direction. So Z is Z is there. And this is x. Let me just make this tidier. That's an x. Uh, sorry, that's a, a z. And yeah, so then we have that, that definition. Okay, so we know then how to integrate over a planar triangular region T three kinds of expressions a dx wedge dy a dy wedge dz and a dz wedge dx i've given three definitions um now for a planar oriented triangle t and three constant numbers a b c we can make the following definition if we write the integral over t of the expression a dx wedge dz plus b dy wedge dz plus c dz wedge dx we can define that to be the sum of the three integrals that i've just defined the integral over t of a dx wedge dy plus the integral over t of now i've changed the a to the b b dy wedge dz plus the integral over t of c dz wedge dx and so we have then the notion of a of an integral of such an expression where a b c are constant and t is a planar triangular region so now let's suppose that uh, if we go back to our surface s and uh, suppose that we have a sequence of triangulations partitions p0 p1 p2 or whatever um a sequence becoming better and better approximations to s and real valued functions now a of x y z b of x y z c of x y z then what we can do is we can define the integral over the surface s of the expression a of x y z dx wedge dy plus b of x y z dy wedge dz plus c of x y z dz wedge dx we can define that uh, as follows we can take it to be the limit as we go down our sequence of partitions, our sequence of approximations. So the limit as n tends to infinity of, and then for each for the nth partition, what do we do? We sum over all the triangles in the nth partition. Let's call it the, the triangles will be let's call them t1, t2, and in tip, in general tj. We sum over all the triangles tj. The following entity the integral over the planar triangular region tj of the number a mu v uh, a, a evaluated at nu j where nu j is chosen from within the triangle tj dx wedge dy plus b evaluated at nu j where nu j is a point chosen from it within the triangle tj so b of nu j dy wedge dz plus c of nu j dz wedge dx yeah, so where the nu j is chosen in the jth triangle of the nth partition and we let n tend to infinity so that is a a, a definition of an integral um it's a hard definition to work with um of course the limit may or may not exist and there are all kinds of questions but it is probably good um to start off uh, talking about surface integrals by having a good understanding of the definition uh, because there are many many techniques on how to how to perform integrals and there's a danger of confusing what's a technique and what's a definition this is that this is the definition and then we'll have to think about the definition to design some techniques for actually calculating uh, this number this, this integral in in particular examples but there's a definition let's look at an example to, to finish with now i'm going to take an easy example 
where the surface S is a very easy surface. It's just a planar triangular region. So take S to be the planar triangular region in three-dimensional space with vertices 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, minus 1, and 4, 2, 1. In that order, meaning that let's specify an orientation on this triangle S. The, given that the triangle, uh, uh, the, the, given that S is a triangle, we can specify the orientation by putting an order on the vertices, and the order we'll go is first is one one two, second is three three five minus one, and third is four two one. That's the order. So um, let's try to apply the definition from the previous slide uh, to this calculation. Okay, so in yellow I've drawn. Um, the yellow triangle S. This is the triangle S. Uh, oops, drawn there in three dimensional space. What we need to do is um, we need to work out uh, the projection into the xy plane. We also need to work out later the projection into the yz plane and the projection into the uh, xz plane but first of all let's focus on the xy plane and projecting into the xy plane we see that point 421 uh, we just forget the z goes to point 42 point 35 minus 1 goes to point 35 point 112 gets projected to point 11 so i've drawn the three points in blue and i've joined them up and we can see that the orientation, uh, we, we start at 4, 2 and go to 1, 1 and then go to 3, 5. So that arrow uh, corresponds to, to the orientation in on the blue triangle induced from that on the yellow triangle. We have to do the same thing uh, in the YZ plane. So this yellow triangle gets projected to the yz plane this time we just forget the x coordinate so 4 2 1 goes to 2 1 uh, 3 5 minus 1 goes to 5 minus 1 and 1 1 2 goes to 1 2 so we have three points in the yz plane um, and then the orientation on s induces an orientation on the blue triangle and then finally, we have to do the same projection into the zx plane, and there we have the triangle there. One thing to note then is that um, the three orientations, so the first orientation, the first blue triangle I con uh, considered, when viewed from up the z-axis, that orientation is clockwise. So it's clockwise, so there's going to be a sine minus one when we do our calculation of the integral. The second blue triangle to consider also has a clockwise orientation when viewed from up the x-axis. And so too does the third blue triangle when viewed from up the y-axis. So all blue triangles are going to contribute signs minus 1. Now what we need to do is work out the area of a blue triangle, of each of these three blue triangles. Um, and the best way to do that... Certainly, it's the best way for, 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 for subsequent calculations is to remember from first year um, the formula for the area of a parallelogram. Remember in first year that if you have two vectors from the origin of the plane, two vectors in the plane emanating from the origin, they can be completed to form a parallelogram and then the area of that parallelogram is the is up to sign is the determinant of the matrix whose rows are the two vectors i'll say that again if you have two vectors in the plane originating from the origin those two vectors can be completed to form a parallelogram and then we saw in first year that the area of that parallelogram is just the determinant of the matrix whose rows are the two vectors well, plus or minus one. Area is always positive, so you have to be careful about plus or minus one. But in this setup, when I say area, I mean area. Area is always, when I talk of area in this 
podcast I mean a positive number area can never be negative I, area is always positive uh, and so we can get the area by taking a, a determinant so let's try that in the first of the blue triangles we considered so what I can do then to work out the area of uh, this blue triangle of course a blue triangle is um, is half of a parallelogram no, it's half of a parallelogram so um, and the area of so I don't need to draw that uh, the area of a blue triangle then is a half of now I take the the I take one of my vertices in the blue triangle I'll take the vertex 1 1 and I'll consider the vectors emanating from 1 1 so it's um, the, the one of these vectors I take 3 5 minus 1 1 and I get 2 4 I've put 2 4 here and then I look at the other vector, um, 4, 2, minus 1, 1, I get 3, 1, I've put 3, 1 there. So I've put my two vectors uh, into this de determinant. I evaluate the determinant, 3, 4 is a 12, minus 2 is 10. And of course, I'm not interested in the area of a parallelogram. I'm interested in the area of half of the parallelogram, this triangle. So I, it's a half of that. So the area is a half of that determinant, a half of 10, which is 5. So I do the same calculation for the other two triangles. Um... Maybe I, I, I've done them both together. Um, so the other two, the areas of the other two triangles can be calculated the same way. Uh, the, the areas are 7 over 2 and 1 over 2. So now I go back to the definition of the integral that I'm trying to calculate. And the integral that I'm trying to calculate is the sum of these individual integrals. So the sum of the individual integrals, what were the individual integrals? Here was the individual integral. It was the number, if I'm trying to integrate over a triangle, t, a, dx, wedge, dy, it's plus or minus, and the number a times the area of the blue triangle. So I'll do this here. I've got the areas of the blue triangles. So now I, I do my, my calculation. The first number was 2, so let's just go back. Um, it's 2 dx wedge dy. So it, for 2 dx wedge dy, I write time 2 times the area of the first blue triangle times plus or minus 1. So I write 2 times 5 plus or minus 1, but I choose minus 1 because the curved arrow is curved and is curved clockwise in the first triangle. And in fact, the, 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 the orientation, as I said, is clockwise in all of these three um, triangles. So th the sign is always going to be minus. So I get minus 7 over 2, minus 1 over 2. And the only other thing I have to remember is it's a 3 dy wedge dz plus a 4 dz wedge dx. So what I get then is... Um, 3 times minus 7 over 2 plus 4 times minus a half, which comes to, um, if I've done my sum right, uh, minus 32 and a half. Okay, so that is the calculation of uh, an integral over a surface of some expression uh, 2dx wedge dy plus 3dy wedge dz plus 4dz wedge dx. I make a comment, and it's the following. In a subsequent podcasts, we'll want to evaluate other integrals, but evaluating integrals um, in general will require m more thought let me change that to a T, will require more thought when S is not a planar triangle. This example I worked through now was particularly easy because the surface S was just one planar triangle. Um, so I didn't have to 
use limits or anything. Um, I, I, my, my approximation to the surface was perfect. The surface was one planar triangle, so I have a perfect approximation. When the surface is curved, I'd have to do a bit of approximating and I'd have to take limits, so there's something to be done there. And also, what made this example particularly simple was that I took uh, constants A, B, C, with, I think it was 2, 3 and 4. In general, A, B, C will not be constant, they'll be functions. So that will also complicate the slightly the, the, the calculation of integrals. But at least we have the definition of what we're trying to calculate uh, reasonably rigorously presented. Okay, thanks for listening.